goes to Paul. That, I think, is an important contrast. Paul seems almost frustrated by this point. He quotes a prophecy from Isaiah about the hearts of people being blind and the ears of people being covered because they do not hear. If they heard and saw and repented, their hearts would be converted and they would be healed. God sends salvation to the Gentiles and they listen. So Paul seems to finally have taken this message to heart that he has been entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles. And not that he hasn't been doing that the entire time. He certainly has. But he's sort of understanding the impact of what it means. It talks about him remaining under house arrest for two years. And he receives people who come to him for two years. And then the story is just going to kind of end. He received all who came to him with complete assurance and without hindrance. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the end of the book. Like it just sort of ends kind of suddenly. So this is something that we have to fill in a little bit. This is a long house arrest. Part of it could be that it takes a long time for his court case to be heard. You know, if Caesar, if they accepted appeals from all over the empire, you sort of get there, they're like, okay, we add you to the list. Your trial is in 24 months. Okay, have fun. Come back in 24 months. <laughs> Something like that. Like, it just seems like they're busy or they're caught or whatever. Um, the Gentiles are given the opportunity to hear the gospel and to accept it because the Jews reject it. Paul, after this encounter with the Jewish leaders, it doesn't mention further encounters with the Jewish leaders. It just sort of ends. Um, so... There are some possibilities that could take place. One of them is that this is a bit before he dies. And so he's under house arrest for a couple years. And the Romans finally look at his case and they're like, meh, this isn't worthy of a trial, you know, or it goes to trial and he's not declared guilty of charges that deserve death. And so he's released. The Romans throughout the story have not been nearly as interested in hunting him down as the Jews have. They sort of think of him as maybe a crazy preacher. Yeah, that's the shipwreck guy. Don't get on a boat with him. But other than that, you know, he's not so bad. It is possible that Paul is out of arrest for a while and goes on to Spain and makes that further missionary journey. There is some evidence that he reached further west than Rome in several places. Um, and the Romans really don't seem interested in the Jewish theological argument about Jesus being the Messiah or not. They just don't care. He remains faithful to his roots. He has a he has this dedication, he has this desire to bring his people to salvation, to bring his people to knowledge of Christ, whether they listen or not. And he's willing to continue to work, even in cases where it seems like it's not accomplishing his purpose, in order to continue to honor that place that he came from and his roots. The final message, it notes, kind of, it ends in a good spot. After all the trials and all the shipwrecks and all of the stuff, it talks about him proclaiming with boldness, Jesus is the Messiah without hindrance. He's no longer being frustrated by the people around him. And the end of the book of Acts is the arrival of the gospel in Rome. The journey of the gospel of, of Luke was from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Now, in the book of Acts, it takes us from Jerusalem to Rome. And there's something beautiful about the sense that the message of the gospel, one of her preachers arrives at the heart of the empire, and that's sort of 
the, as they would say, the rest is history. The rest of the story is what continues to unfold historically. Um, you know, the church in Rome is established and begins to grow. And in Rome and in areas of Greece and Asia, the church grows much more quickly than it did in the specifically Jewish communities. Although sometimes it is hard because we do have to remember that most of the early followers of Jesus were Jewish. Many of the early converts were Jewish. Uh, so sometimes this picture is presented that there's all this Jewish resistance to the gospel and it's just at loggerheads the whole time. There's definitely Jewish resistance to the gospel, but it's not everyone. And there are large numbers of people that do convert, um, at least relatively speaking. Remember that for much of the time until much later, the church remains relatively small. The letters that Paul writes are to churches of maybe 100, maybe 200, but certainly not 10,000 or 20,000. It's not like a modern day diocese. There aren't parishes all over. At this point, Mo if there are churches at all in any formal sense of the word, they're house churches, large, large estates where Christians would gather. Um, part of it could also be because this book is finished right around the time of the beginning of the Neronian persecution, which I think starts in about 64 AD. Um, if you remember, in Israel, the temple is going to be destroyed in 70 AD. The Jewish revolt is happening at the same time. So in some ways, there's tensions around the empire. And Nero begins a persecution of the Christians, the first major widespread persecution of the Christians from Roman authorities comes from Nero. And that starts around 64. Paul likely dies in 67. But when you're under persecution, it's not the time where you stop and stay in one place and write books. Uh, you have to flee and be much more careful about what is written down. And that could also be why the book seems to come to a premature end. It could be that Luke travels elsewhere or that he has accomplished his purpose, that he's setting up the life of the church. There's lots of possibilities, um, but it's the end of the book of Acts. Um, do they know when and where he died? I believe that the when is during the persecution of Nero, which puts us from 64 to 67. The traditional spot where Paul died is that he was beheaded outside the city at a spot that's now called Tre Fontenay, the Three Fountains. The tradition is that the Romans cut off his head and it bounced on the ground three times and where it bounced, water came up out of the ground. It sounds odd to us, but you can travel to the Church of the Three Fountains today on the spot where Paul was martyred. And then I believe, I forget its relationship to St. Paul outside the walls, but I believe that's where he was buried. So he was martyred kind of it's kind of across the street and down the road a little bit and then he was taken some distance and buried but the basilica now that is at saint paul outside the walls is on top of that spot um, that is a rebuild of the constantinian basilica so constantine in the 300s built a basilica for saint paul where he died and the modern or that church burned down in the 1800s i think it's the late 1800s and they rebuilt it in the same proportions with the same design um, it's the one if you go to rome today it's the one with all the pictures of the popes they have all these mosaics along the walls and there's 200 and some pictures of all of the popes throughout the history of the church. Um, 
So I'm not sure that we can nail down the exact year that he died. The traditional year that I've heard is 67, that Paul and Peter die in the same year, which is 67 AD. But I'm sure that within a year or two on either side, um, it could be possible. Date keeping has also changed a bit, and we're much more particular about it now than they were. Um, but it is in that time period. There's good records of that. Like I said, it, it could be a little bit like, well, was it in December of 66 or was it in January of 67? You know, well, it's two weeks different or whatever. Um, but very, very likely around that time within a short distance on either side is the death of Paul. So, yeah, she asked about it being strange that the Romans didn't seem so concerned, but then they're the ones that kill him. I propose to you that it's because it's two different things. So the first one is his trial, which came out of Jerusalem from the Jews. On that charge, they're not very interested in convicting Paul and killing him. When the persecution of Nero arises, the Romans basically decide to kill them all, especially their leaders. And so it's not that they killed him because of the charges of the Jews from his earlier trial. It's that he was killed because he was a leader of the Christian church. Um, I mean, Nero was a bad man. Like, he would have banquets on his patio and have crucified people and light them on fire to provide the light for his dinner party. He had Christians sewn into the skins of animals and thrown into the Colosseum and the places of gladiatorial combat so they would be eaten by lions and other animals. He was grouchy. <laughs> and not... Nero is not a nice person. Um, he was very much, you could think of him like in the ancient version of a Vladimir Putin or an Adolf Hitler or a Mao Zedong, and you'd be pretty close to the truth. He was mad at the world. He thought that he knew better than everyone else, and he had all the power, and so he ran amok. So, I guess in this case, I would argue that it's likely two different sets of circumstances. Um, and by the time that Paul is killed, like many of the martyrs that we celebrate, St. Lawrence and St. Peter and lots of these early popes and different people, they were killed by people like Nero and this persecution that starts from Nero. Lots of the early martyrs that we celebrate die in his persecution. Um, probably to the tune of several thousand, if not more than that. Okay, we've come to the end of the book of Acts.